Well, hello. I'm Hannes. I'll start with a fun fact about me. Um, NDC Porto, like the first one, 2019, was the second ever conference I ever gave a talk at. And I've spoken at all the NDC Portos ever since. So it always feels great to come back and feels a little bit like coming home. So thank you for letting me tell my story today. Um, this was not the talk I was originally planned to give, but it's, I'm jumping in for somebody who couldn't make it. And I'm glad you all showed up anyway. I'm going to start with a small dis disclaimer. This talk, you're not going to learn a lot about programming. Um, so if that was what you're expecting, I won't hold it against you if you leave the room. Um, if you're the last person leaving, we head to the bar together because don't, then I don't have a job to, de to do. So that's great. Um, so like run away as somebody, you remember this from the keynote, right? You can, you can leave the room if that was your expectation of this talk. So let's dive in. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, why I started building guitars. I want to talk a little bit about craftsmanship some technical stuff about guitar building, some myths about guitar building, and then I want, I want to close the day by talking a little bit about the concept of irreversibility. So building guitars, you might wonder, what is a software developer doing building guitars? And that has to take me back to 2012. I was living in this house, and my first son, I now have three kids, but my first son was about a year old, we were renovating this house. We moved in with my in-laws. I highly recommend against ever doing that, but I did. Um, for my, my com I was already working at Access. I've been there like forever. Um, but I just started at a new customer, and that didn't really click because they basically treated their consultants as code monkeys instead of people who could contribute. And all of this together, like, caused me to completely burn out. And that's weird, because until this point in my career, I had very firmly believed that when the going gets tough, you just push a little bit harder, right? Burnout is what happens to the weak, and I could always pull through. Now, let me tell you, I woke up one day, and I couldn't bring myself to get out of my bed. It's like, I cannot go to work. So I called my manager, it's like, yeah, um, Don, I'm not going to make it into work today. Not feeling too well, I'm going to go to the doctor later. And then my doctor was very smart about it. He told me, Hannes, you're a bit overworked. Maybe you should take a week or two off, right? If he would have told me at that point, you're going to be home for five months, I would have gone straight back to work, right? But I didn't. I stayed home for two weeks. Um, took a long time to recover from all of this. And why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm telling this for two reasons. First of all, I truly believe that all of the mental health stuff doesn't get discussed nearly enough. Um, otherwise, it also led to me building guitars. Because in my recovery process, I started talking to a psychologist, and I took some antidepressants, and we had to finish that renovation so we could move out of my in-law's house and move back into our own house. And it took a lot of exercise and being in nature. Um, and one of the things that I had seriously neglected until that point was making time for myself. So on my search with my psychologist, like, Hannes, what kind of hobby would you like to have? I didn't really have an answer. I had stopped doing all of the hobbies that I had before. Um, and I didn't want to revisit them necessarily. So we, in the discovery process, I found out about me that very much in my hobbies, like in my profession, I'm looking for challenges. I'm looking for stuff where I can never do the same thing twice. I need to always apply myself. I need to learn more. Um, I love the community aspect of things. I love this, like talking to people, like one-on-one -on, -one and on stages. And, um, and I really, really take pride in learning skills. So I was looking for a hobby that had all of these. And figure out, hey, I play guitar, why don't I build, guitar build guitars? So, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I didn't even have any woodworking skills at this point. I was very good at DIY stuff. Um, like doing a lot of stuff around the house, but never really into woodworking. So, um, I took evening classes for woodworking, because that's something I could do. There were no instrument building evening schools near me. The only one was like a day school. And I couldn't really afford to quit my job. So <clears throat> I 
woodworking was it. And I am now a licensed carpenter. Nice, right? Um, never done anything with that. But. And I read a lot of books, and we live in this amazing age where so much knowledge is out there and it's available. And you can find YouTube channels by people who are building guitars and showing you all of the little details. I learned so much. Uh, for instance, from Ben from Crimson Guitars, fantastic YouTube channel. You can feel his passion when he's building guitars. And I figured, I'm going to do this. I'm going to order some templates, and I'm going to order some materials, and, and all of this is going to be fun. I'm going to start with a simple guitar. And the reason I, I chose a Fender Jazzmaster, the green guitar is the first one I ever built. Um, I chose a simple guitar, and the reason that Fender guitars are simple is because Leo Fender was not an instrument builder. He was an engineer. So what he did is he optimized guitar for be, uh, guitars for being easy to construct and use a minimal amount of wood. So he made some design choices in those guitars that actually makes them a lot simpler construction-wise uh, than a Gibson, for instance. And it took me about six months, and I ended up with that. And I'm very much the kind of person who goes all in. So a full commitment is what I'm thinking of. The, um, a lot of people start by buying a neck or, and then making a body for that, or maybe buying an old guitar and then making some modifications. I didn't really want to do that. So this is the wood after I had like, glued it and resawn it. Um, but like, this was very much just planks of wood that I bought from a um, lumber yard. And except for the, the fretboard wood, because that is reclaimed wenge. Wenge is wood that is protected at the moment. You can no longer source it. But if you can find a construction site where they're te tearing it down, you can like dive into the dumpster and steal it. This is how I got that wood. Um, and I started building, and I loved every minute of it. I really did. But a lot of things started to click in my head. It's like, why do I like building guitars? And it's basically the same things that attract me to be a software developer. So first of all, we as software developers, we have to acquire quite a bit of knowledge throughout our careers. We have to learn about certain frameworks. We learn about all the libraries that we're using. Who of you are .NET developers? Yeah, most of you, right? Like learning which NuGet packages to, to use for certain pro uh, problems. You learn about architectures, and you learn about your cloud providers, and you learn about clean code, and, and, and about solid, and DDD, and all of those things, and you need to acquire it. It always feels like you need to learn another thing, right? Which is why you're here, which is why you're at NDC. You want to learn more, yet you chose to talk on guitar building and not software development. Let's dive into that later. Um, <laughs> But still, you have to acquire a lot of knowledge. And woodworking is very much the same, because some of the things that really baffled me is um, I knew that some woods were harder than others, right? What I didn't know is that that has nothing to do with how well they hold up to water, right? Beach, for instance, is a very, very hard kind of wood. But if you leave it out in the rain, it's going to rot in less than a year. On the other hand, there are, there are woods that are very soft that you can easily leave outside for 20 years and they'll still be fine, right? So all of these things are using the right kinds of woods in the right kinds of scenarios is very important, and especially if you move into instrument building. Um, in acoustics, you're going to deal with resonance, but also in electrics, you're going to need stable woods, you're going to want to have the weight balance to be right, so you're going to pick the right densities of wood and all of that sort of stuff. You also have to learn about tools. There are so many tools in the woodworking world that I know nothing about. And how to properly use a chisel, how to properly use a plane, how to deal with stuff uh, with the grain or on end grain and all of that sort of stuff, I needed to learn. And there are so many different types of glue. Like traditionally, in, in violin building, um, like in the old days, in the 16th century and stuff, people used glues that were made from animal hides, right? And those glues are, are heated up, and then you can use it to really bond wood together. But you can also remove it again by heating it up. And different glues have different um, 
different ways that you can apply them and different uh, construction strengths. And some of them you can take apart and other, others you can't and so on and so on. Some of them resist moisture. So you're learning and you're learning and you're learning all these things and you have to fit that in your head when you're applying that in your hobby. And then there's techniques. As developers, we practice. Like, ah, oh, I'm mentioning TDD and Whitney is sitting there. Uh, <laughs> and pair program. It, this slide is especially for you, David. <laughs> and TDD and pair programming, and we're going to refactor our code, and um, we're going to maybe apply event storming to figure out what we're building, and we're going to do mob programming, and we're doing all these things to actually apply in our work. And it's to get us, us to be more efficient at what we do. And it's very much the same things the same thing with woodworking. You're going to have to learn about how to join pieces of wood together, because even a guitar is not built out of one piece of wood. You're going to be gluing stuff together in different ways, and how you do that is going to affect how that holds up to the strains that you put it through. You're going to also have to learn about how to make templates. A lot of it is making templates, especially in guitar building, because when you're cutting a piece of wood that is expensive, you want to cut it right the first time, right? The body of that guitar is very small, but it's a 100 euro piece of wood, right? If you cut that wrong, that's an expensive evening. You're going to have to learn how to apply finishes and, and what hardware you can use on your cabinets or on your guitars and so on. You're, you're learning so many things. And this is actually um, computer science applied to uh, making wood joints. So what they did is they fed a whole bunch of wood joint data into an AI model. And these are the uh, joints that the model came up with. And then they machined them with a CNC machine to see how they actually work. So this is where our industries kind of overlap in wood joinery. And you'll end up with that sort of stuff. And you're going to practice your skills, both in software development and in woodworking. When we practice, like. A lot of the practice that we get is in our day job, right? We basically practice 40 hours a week. Because let's admit it to ourselves, like half of the stuff that we do, we've never done before, right? So we're practicing. But you're also practicing in pet projects and maybe in workshops that you're taking or when you're doing coding catas. There are so many places where you can practice and hone your skills. And the same thing goes in woodworking. There are like you're cutting a piece of wood with the right tools even takes practice. You got to get a feel to the stuff that you're doing. You can make clean cuts and not so clean cuts. So a lot of the stuff I did in evening school and when I'm making guitars at home, I also practice before I make actual cuts on expensive wood. So I'm usually taking a cheap piece of wood and trying something before I do it on the actual wood. And I practice in a lot of things and I make so many, so many test pieces. Um, especially when I'm taking a router and taking out a, a whole bunch of wood, you, wanna, you want that to go right the first time. So you're practicing it on something cheap, and then until you're satisfied with the, the results, especially like when you're putting down a burn mark, um, you have to heat it to a certain temperature that needs to be matched to the type of wood that you're going to burn, otherwise it will like overburn or burn or underburn. And you have to practice how long you're going to have to keep it down to make sure that you get the desired result. So usually what I do is I use an offcut of the piece of wood that I'm um, burning, and I do a couple of test tries until I'm happy. It's like, OK, hold it down for eight seconds and do that. Like all that sort of stuff, you're testing, testing, testing. Then the actual work becomes really easy, right? It feels a little bit like test-driven development. You write all of your tests and then, tests and then writing the code becomes easy because you've thought about it and you've um, figured everything out in your head how that's going to click. And your first joints are going to look something like this. And most woodworkers never make it to this, right? And when you're looking at that in your head, you might think, like, how is that even fitting together? This is like Japanese wood joinery. And if you Google that, there's a whole bunch of what I would like to call woodworking porn out there. And if you see this in your mind, it doesn't work. How does this even slide together? And I can assure you, these are two pieces of wood that have not been bent. Nothing has been tricked. I can actually show you how they slide together. They slide together diagonally. So all of the planes of all of those things, they are coplanar in one direction, and you can slide it on a 45 degree angle, it slides in. That's an art. People cut those by hand with chisels. Um, I'm not that good. 
So let's admit that. But one thing that is very important in all of this is having sharp tools. And being very good at uh, sharpening your tools defines how good of the results you're going to get. Um, and it's, very, uh, it's a very common misconception that you can cut yourself really easily with sharp tools. Usually, it doesn't happen as often with a sharp tool because you have to apply way less pressure, which means that you're probably not going to slip. So having sharp tools is very important. And sharp tools in this context is if you buy a chisel in a hardware store, let's say that you go to your DIY store or whatever, they're not really char sharp. So sharp for me means like I can shave the hairs of the back of my hand after I'm done sharpening, like razor sharp, right? And that's the only way I can get really clean cuts on all of the, reels, uh, on all of the really small stuff. But it also makes sure that my wood doesn't split, because as soon as you're applying force, you might pull the wood fibers apart, and when your wood splits, you're going to have to glue it back together, and it's going to cost you a lot of time. So it's a lot safer to do this with sharp tools. The system I use is called uh, Scary Sharp. Scary Sharp was invented by a um, British woodworker. Um, it's basically the cheapest um, sharpening system where you can get very, very consistent results. So the piece of glass that you're seeing here is a piece of float glass. It's as flat as you need it to be for sharpening stuff. It is very, very, very flat. The way they make that glass is by floating glass on a bath of mercury while it's curing, and that makes it as flat as the curvature of the earth. For all intents and purposes in woodworking, that is flat enough, right? And then you apply really fine uh, sandpapers to it. Like the finest sandpaper has grains that are one micron big. It's like a thousandth of a millimeter um, made out of alum aluminum oxide. And then you use a jig to make sure that your blade, that you're pulling it at the same angle every time. So you get a perfect edge on that piece of metal so that you can get a plain blade or a chisel to perfect and consistent sharpness every single time. And you spend quite a, time, a bit of time doing this. It's like, OK, I'm going to make this. Oh, and you feel the blade's not sharp enough. First, spend a bit of time sharpening before you actually start cutting. Now I want to talk about tools. As software developers, we have it pretty good. Like, our tools, relatively cheap. Go ask a plumber how much money is in the back of their van, and as a software developer, you'll be surprised. Like, if you would buy a high-end computer tomorrow, and then a great screen with it, and maybe a, a very nice and comfy um, chair for your desk, and the license for your software, it's like, if you drop 10K on a setup, you're going to have a nice setup, right? We agree? Make it 15, right? 15K in woodworking tools, it's gone like that, like really. Um, and that is the problem. You'll, you'll start acquiring all of the tools that you maybe want or could use or whatever. And I have a mix of stuff that I buy new or stuff that I buy at flea markets and then restore. I have a passion of, for tools that have had a life before I own them. So I definitely have a couple of hand planes that are older than I am, which I then acquired and restored, and now they're in full, uh, in full function. I love that feeling of giving something a second life, right? Um, also because that's way cheaper, right? You can get a very, very decent long hand plane um, for like 50 euros if you're willing to spend two evenings restoring it. If you would buy a new one from a quality vendor like Lee Nielsen, you're looking at dropping 600 euros on a hand plane. So, I mean, it's about what, how much money do you want to pour into a hobby and how much time are you willing to spend to save some of that time. If you don't care for the restoring of the tools, buy the new ones, but otherwise. And then there is this German company. Who here has heard of Festool? None of you? OK, Festool is a German company. And I made that quote up, but it's very true. What they do is they make power tools. And you may be familiar with Bosch and Dewalt and Makita and whatever. They make those kind of tools. But they're made by German engineers who have been told, like, you're going to make the most ergonomic tool, the, most, the lightest tool, 
the easiest to repair tool that you can build. It has to be the, the quietest that you can make it, like the best tool you can, you can possibly produce. Price? Yeah. After thought. So their prices do reflect their quality. Um, and they do have attachments for all of this, their tools to do all of the weird little things that you might want to do in woodworking. So this is a dovetail joint jig that they have with their um, routers where you could just clamp in two pieces of wood, put in the right router uh, cutter, and just move it across like this, and you'll have a perfect dovetail joint every single time. Now, just a jig without the router is probably like 800 euros or something. So the reason that you cannot have all of the tools made by them is because it's prohibitively expensive to um, own all of them. Which brings us to the reality of owning tools. It's... If you understand the tools that you have and you know how you can apply them in different scenarios, you can basically use, um, there are multiple ways to skin a cat, right? You can use your tools in different ways to acquire the same result. And a lot of that is experience. And we are the same way. If we learn about certain frameworks and we get familiar with certain programming languages, we often have many different ways to do something. But in some point, you you start to reason about what do you have available to you in this project? What technology are we already using? What, is this, what are the skills of the developers that are involved? And you make your choices based on that, not on what would be the optimal choice to solve this one problem, because you're going to end up with a technology stack that is huge if you choose the perfect piece of technology to solve every problem. You can usually not afford to do that, right? There's always a balance, and it's the same way. It's the same way in woodworking. It's the same way in uh, software development. So let me talk you through some of the technical stuff that goes into building guitars. Now, let me first talk about how we come to produce sound from a string that vibrates. Um, it's usually it's a piece of wire that is put under tension between two points, and the pitch of the note is affected by three factors. It's the length of the string, the amount of tension that you put on it, and, um, and the thickness of the string, the density, actually. Not, not just the thickness, but the density. Um, and basically, by making your strings thicker, you make the note lower. And by making them thinner, you make them higher. Applying more tension raises the pitch of the note as well. And making it shorter also raises the pitch of the note. And in a guitar, we basically use all three of these methods. Because we have six strings, and the strings have di different uh, thicknesses across, um, giving us lower notes at the top and higher notes at the bottom. We're also changing the tension to tune the note to get the exact right pitch that we want. We're going to actually change, yeah, on this guitar you tune here, not there. Um, so you, you, you're going to change the pitch of the note by uh, adjusting the tension. And when you're actually playing the guitar, what you're doing is you're changing the length of the string, which also affects your uh, pitch as well. So on a guitar, you use all of those techniques to make sure that all the right notes are coming out. And the tricky thing is, you, this fretboard is the piece of wood that here that we attach our frets to. And that needs to be... Um, there's a couple of things that we need to know about. And first of all is the radius. They're never completely flat. There's always a little bit of a curve going this way, right? Now, the most comfortable thing is a lot of machine-built guitar builders, what they do is they take the same radius across the whole fretboard. But as you can see, it's a little bit narrower there than it is here. So what you're getting is a little bit more height difference between the outside and the middle uh, near the top of the fretboard than near, near the bottom, right? So if you want to solve that problem, you're going to do a compound radius, where the radius of the circle here will probably be around 12 inches, and up here maybe around 16 inches, which gives you a more comfortable fretboard to play. Now, radiusing a fretboard needs to be pretty precise. A fretboard needs to be very, very, very flat. Because as soon as you fret a note and your string vibrates against the next fret, you have a problem. You get something called fret bus. And you need to calculate your positions really accurately as well. So for radius, if you want to use a steady radius, you can make radius blocks. So I decided to build my own. I built this whole pendulum sled thing to make my own blocks to 
uh, which I then uh, attach sandpaper to, to make sure that I get the right radius. Um, I still use these blocks, but sometimes I also do the, the compound radiuses, which you can actually only do by hand or with a CNC machine. Um, the leather, which I don't own yet. Um, but with a CNC machine, you can easily do compound radiuses by hand, actually, as well. If you have a long hand plane, it's actually not that hard to make a nice compound radius. If you, if you already cut the shape of the fretboard, that, that trapezium, and you go in by hand, like the compound radius almost happens out of itself. It's just the way that your plane um, makes that shape. Fret positions need to be very accurate. And by accurate, I mean when you're drawing them out on a piece of wood, you need to account for the thickness of your pencil line. I use a half millimeter mechanical, mechanical pencil. Um, I cannot to be, afford to be off by too much when I'm doing that. And it's actually really easy. You have the scale length um, where uh, the strings vibrate here until the bridge over there. And halfway through is exactly one octave up. It's like 12 half notes up is exactly half of the scale. That's just the way that physics work. So by extrapolating that across the entire fretboard, you have very, very accurate positions of where these need to be. And they will evolve with you as you change the length of the scale. Because Gibson guitars have a little bit of a shorter scale. It's so we're only talking about like a centimeter and a half, right? But a little bit of a shorter scale. And Fender guitars have a little bit of a longer scale. That means that all of the frets have to move along to make that guitar sound right. So if you put a neck of the wrong scale length on a body that wasn't made for that, there will be no note across that neck that will sound in tune. If you put that bridge in the wrong position, then your entire neck needs to be remade because it needs to have those, uh, those frets in different positions. And then there is something called string tension. When we string up a guitar just like this, if you put these strings under tension where that guitar is in tune and you add up the tension across that entire neck, you end up with 101 pounds of tension that are on that neck at all times. And you're not detuning that guitar whenever you stop playing. I mean, that remains on there, usually for the lifetime of the guitar. Now, what happens to a piece of wood, even if you only pull it under a very, very, very parallel angle to the wood, it's still pulling up just a little bit. It's putting pressure, and it's trying to pull the neck up by the strings, right? And 101 pounds isn't isn't little. I mean, that's the weight of my 12-year-old son, right? That's on that guitar at all times. So how do we counteract that is when we make a neck, we, put, uh, we, we first route out a groove, and then we put in something called a truss rod. And mechanically, this is made by a solid bar of metal. And then we have a moving bar of metal in the, in the bottom, and we have two opposing pieces of thread. Which means that if we turn, usually here with a hex key or a screwdriver, when we turn that, which me means that it will bring the bottom points either closer together or further apart, which means we can, we can basically make that piece of metal bend up or down, right? And that is sitting in that guitar neck. So when over time the strings pull up the wood, you can turn the bottom rod and that'll pull it back down and you can keep your neck flat again. So that's what truss rods do. They look a little bit like this um, if you buy them. These are the two ends. Um, this is the, the, the side where you adjust it, and the other side is like the, where you don't need access to it. So usually you either go in from the headstock part or like the bottom of the neck on the other side. It really depends on your guitar's construction. But like a, a lot of modern guitars have those in them. And then there is a thing called <coughs> string vibration. If we, if we Think about how strings actually vibrate. It seems very simple. We have two points, and it'll be this ellipsis between them. But it's actually not really true, because it's also standing waves that move up and down the neck. So the vibration patterns are this, but also this at the same time, and also this at the same time, and this, and, and, and further and further and further. They're actually the overtones that you can hear 
um, if you analyze the sound of, of a vibrating string. So it's vibrating at the pitch and also an octave up and two octaves up and so on. You hear all those overtones in the sound of your guitar. But it's actually vibrating with all those things at the same time. But what you have to pay attention to, I mean, this is exaggerated, obviously, but you can see that the vibration pattern from the contact point is actually going up pretty steep. It might hit the next fret really easily, right? And that's something you keep into account when you're setting up a neck. So this is, this is the neck, and ideally, you make it completely flat. If you start with a completely flat neck, which means if you push down the string, the string is going to go up towards the bridge on this side, and it might not touch the next fret. But if you make it dead flat, it means you cannot bring the strings down very, very, very low. And that's what us guitarists like. We like to have low action. We, we like to put very little pressure on the notes that we're playing and not a lot. So how you can get the lowest action is actually not by having your fretboard being dead flat. But I'm talking about a couple of thousandths of an inch, right? Like a couple of hundredths of a millimeter that we're going to move away from a flat neck. First of all, we introduce a little bit of back bow. That's line number one. We're actually going to allow the neck to bow up a little bit. That'll give us a little bit of wiggle room, especially on the, on the notes that are close to the headstock, to actually bring the strings down a little bit lower. But that brings us into problem when we get to the in problems on the high notes, because there we will be very close to f uh, flat, and that back bow is going to cause us trouble again. So what we do is on a neck, the last everything above the 12th fret, we're going to file away at a little angle. But I'm talking about an angle that is between the 12th fret and the 22nd fret. We're only going to take away the thickness of a piece of tape, right? Like a single piece of tape, that is like the amount that, that we're bringing that back. But that allows me to bring the overall action of the neck down a little bit lower, and it makes the guitar easier to play. And it's stuff that you don't really notice at first, but you'll end up with this kind of S-shaped um, fretboard. You won't even see it. If you put your eye against it, it looks that flat, but it's fractions of millimeters, and it makes all the difference in playability. And then intonation is a tricky thing as well, because strings don't vibrate exactly at the contact point. It's very annoying. For a thin string, the vibration point is very, very close to the contact point, but for a thicker string, um, actually, the string doesn't bend as easily, which means that the, the, the real vibration point isn't really at the contact point at the bridge or at the nut. It's a little bit further in, which means that on a guitar, we can actually move these saddles back and forward a little bit to compensate for that. And you're trying to get your neck to be in tune in as many places as you can. Because not only the intonation points, also, the fact that you're pressing down on the string, you're slightly changing the, the tension on the string as well, and that also affects your note. It's always a compromise. There is no way to set up a guitar so that every single note on the neck sounds in tune. You're going to try to get as close to it as you possibly can. And then there are engineers who say, yes, we can. And this is what a true temperament fretboard looks like. These are engineers that went like, yes, we can make a neck where every single note is in tune. And they were not wrong. I mean, they succeeded. The only problem is, like, except for people with very, very specialized equipment, nobody can make a fretboard like that. Nobody can work on a fretboard like that. I cannot pull the frets on that and put new frets in because I have no way to bend my fret wire like that. So as soon as you go down this route, it means that you're actually buying fretboards and fret wire from them for the rest of your life, right? And you, like the, just one fretboard is about the price of a mid-range guitar. But it does exist. You can have perfect intonation. I held one of those guitars once. It's really weird to play. If you look, it's like, yeah, no, it, it feels very strange. But at least it works. There's also people playing with um, bridges that keep a constant tension. So on the, on the bottom end of the guitar, uh, behind this plate, what they'll do is they'll have a tension system with springs that as soon as you push down a note on the neck, that, string will give, that spring will give a little bit, and you will still have the same tension on the string 
as if the node were unfretted. And they try to improve intonation in that way as well. Um, they're called Evertune bridges. So there's a whole bunch of ways that people try to improve on the classical designs of, of guitars. And pickups make all of the difference as well. Now, in essence, a pickup is what translates the vibration of your string into an actual sound we can amplify, right? When we're building electric guitars, what we need is a signal that we can run into something and then send it through a speaker. And in essence, this works very simple. We have a coil of copper wire, and there are magnets that are sitting through the copper, and then we vibrate the string above the magnets. And what that does, it, is, it causes a change in the magnetic field of the magnet, because by moving the piece of metal closer or further away, you're changing uh, the magnetic field. And that change in magnetic field induces a current through the copper wire. It's very faint, but at least it's powerful enough for us to amplify it, and that's how we get our sound. Now, the problem with this is also these coils pick up all of the changes in, electric, uh, in uh, magnetic uh, fields. So that means that if you're putting them near um, like electricity wires, that might call, uh, cause your pickup um, to actually pick up all of the um, things that are happening in the environment. So you're going to either need to shield that or come up with a trick. And then Gibson was very smart about it. It's like, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to put two of these coils and we're going to wire them inversely which means that the string that's vibrating above it, that we're going to pick up very accurately. But everything that's coming from the environment, that will cancel itself out because we're wiring two opposite coils together and all of the environment, which is why these are called humbuckers. Like all of the hum that you're getting from the environment, that is going to be destroyed by this construction of this pickup. Right? Now, having different pickups and having different types of pickups also change the sound of your guitar, which is why that guitar has two pickups, a humbucker and a single coil. And I have a couple of switches on there that let me change the configuration of which coils I'm using. That guitar is able to produce seven different sounds. Um, we'll come back to that later. Um, <clears throat> so that's what you're doing when you're wiring a guitar up. You'll have a couple of coils available to you. This and that is determined by the pickups that you're going to put in the guitar. But how you wire that together and which coils you turn on or off, how you uh, maybe in opposite uh, orientation put them together, you have a volume and a tone knob and so on, all of that determines what is coming out of the output jack of the instrument. And there is a whole website like Simon, Seymour Duncan, uh, which is a pickup producer. They have a website with a lot of different wiring diagrams, but I find it fun to like expand on the stuff that's already there. So that's the wiring, and that's the only thing that was tricky on my first guitar. Um, a jazz master basically has two different tone circuits. So the wood construction for that guitar was very simple, but the electrical uh, construction, like the, the wiring, is about as complex as it gets on most electric guitars. And I found that really fun, because this is stuff that I did grasp before I started building guitars. I have been soldering stuff together my whole life. So this was like, yeah, this is where I had a field day. Um, but what you also see is like a lot of it has been done with vintage cloth wiring, which is very annoying to work with, but it looks like vintage correct, and it's why a lot of people in the guitar building world uh, like to use it. It doesn't change the tone, though. It's just snake oil. We all believe that it's better if we do it with cloth wiring, but it doesn't change anything. It's just copper conductors. And that brings us to myths. There are so many myths in the guitar world. So much stuff that people believe which is not true. And the first one is tone wood. Like a lot of people believe that the wood... On, on an acoustic guitar, this is different. If you build acoustic guitars, like the wood is definitely going to be a big portion of what the guitar sounds like. But on that guitar, like the sound that is being picked up is a metal string vibrating above a pickup. But still, some people believe that the wood of the neck and the, the wood of the body and whatever is going to affect how that guitar sounds. And during COVID, which is very funny because people had so much time on their hands, there was this guy. And this guy decided to test the myth of tone wood. And he had spectrum analyzers. And what he did is he started with a, with a very nicely built expensive guitar. Um, and he recorded the sound. And what he did then is he removed the body from the guitar and replaced it by a cheap body. But then he put the pickup at the same position at the same height and re-recorded the guitar. 
And then he, rep he removed the body altogether and replaced it by a piece of 2 by 4 wood and then put the pickup at the same position at the same height and re-recorded the guitar. And then eventually he ended up without a guitar at all, but he, may, he used the same bridge, the, sa uh, the same bridge, the same nut, the same distance between those uh, two contact points. He put the, the pickup at the same position at the same height. Can you guess what his findings were? It was the same, right? So tone wood on electrics, totally a myth. But choose woods that are pretty. I mean, this Visual Studio logo that you may have noticed on this guitar, it's actually wood, right? It's, it's a wood called Purple Heart. Um, it's also, when you're studying woods, you learn about all these things. And it's an actual inlay of wooden pieces into the body. Uh, it gets all the nerds to talk to me when I play that guitar, so it's, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so th these are the factors that actually have been proven to affect your tone. The type of pickup that you're using and where you put it and how high you put it below the strings, that massively affects how the guitar sounds. It is probably the biggest factor together with how long the strings are. Because if you have a longer scale length between your bridge and your nut, what you're going to have is you're going to have strings that are under a different amount of tension and that also changes the tone uh, quite, uh, quite significantly. The thickness of your strings always uh, also changes the tone because you have more metal that is vibrating above, above the pickup, so that has a different effect on what is making its way through. And those are already the three most important factors. Like everything below that is like diminishing returns. The material that your bridge is made of, like putting in a brass bridge instead of a bone bridge, it gives a very, very slight uh, change in sound, but it's we're talking about fractions of percentages here, right? Now, everything, and I mentioned fit there, fit is very important. If something is not solidly attached to the guitar, that is going to mess up, like, the way that your string vibrates. If your bridge is not sitting well, it's not bolted on properly, your nut has a bit of wiggle room, that is going to mess up the guitar tremendously, but everything else is, like, going to uh, have very minimal effects. Also, a myth is um, how the body is joined to the neck. So on this guitar, it's glued in. It's a set neck construction, so that's a middle one. Um, a bolt-on neck is the one that Leo Fender uses because it makes the guitars very easy to produce. You just put a couple of wood screws through the body into the neck, and that like pushes the piece, two pieces of wood together. In the middle one, we glue it in, and in the Neck through is you use the piece of wood that your neck is made of and you pull it all the way through the body and you glue the sides of your body onto that piece of wood, a set neck construction. And guitarists are very opinionated about this. And the reason for that is that a lot of cheap guitars are made with a bolt-on construction. So they have this connotation that a bolt-on must be bad. But if you get a proper bolt-on construction, like some expensive builders do, it resonates just as well as a neck true. Like your sustain is how long the note rings when you pluck it. That is going to be identical between the different constructions if they are well made. The problem is that a lot of poorly made guitars are made with bolt-ons, which gives us the feeling that bolt-ons are cheap and bad. And then there is this, this myth that older guitars are just better, right? They sound better. They they're better built and whatever, and that's just survivor bias, right? All of the guitars that were worth caring for and that made it through to the end, like the, the 50, 60-year-old guitars that made it through to now, those were the guitars that people cared for that were worth caring for, that were worth restoring and then putting effort in, which were like the good samples back then, right? Guitars weren't necessarily built better than back in the days. Because there's this, all these classical guitars, like the guitar world evolves around a lot of classical shapes. You see all your Stratocasters and your Les Pauls and so on. And, and all of these guitars, they come back and all the brands riff on those. But there's people building amazing guitars that color outside of those lines. And I don't really understand why they don't gain a more, a more traction. Actually, the middle one is gaining traction in the metal world at the moment. Um, but the, the left one is a guitar built by my favorite Belgian guitar builder, Tao Guitars. They do this, they always have inspirations from the uh, classic cars, like classic Cadillacs from the American 
uh, 60s and 70s, and they're putting that into their guitars. They make some beautiful stuff, very expensive too. <clears throat> Parker, the one on the right, was uh, somebody who built guitars in the 90s, like 80s and 90s. Um, and Ken Parker was a revolutionary. He was the biggest guitar nerd that we can ever imagine because he innovated so many things on those guitars. They were parts of that were built out of carbon fiber. Um, <clears throat> the body was extremely ergonomic and extremely thin and very light. Um, you had a tremolo system where you could adjust the tension uh, without needing any tools. He experimented with piezo pickups next to magnetic pickups. Like those guitars were, work, were like technologically decades ahead of, of what, he was do, uh, what people were doing at that time. Yet they never gained popularity because a lot of people thought they were ugly. I still want to own one, like just to have that piece of, piece of history. But they're getting increasingly hard to find. And if you find them, the electronics are often broken. Um, <clears throat> because the electronics are very complex and they're impossible to repair. So you need to find one where everything still works, and that is the hard part. The middle one is Steinberger. Um, very cool uh, builder. Uh, it's not Steinberger, it's Strandberg. Sorry, Steinberger is the one that Dylan plays. It's Strandberg. Uh, Strandberg. They're experimenting with making guitars very minimalistic, and what you see there on that neck is fan frets. Not all of the frets are parallel. So the top strings are a little bit longer than the bottom strings. And, and that works out just nice, because it lets your hand naturally move as you play a guitar, which you on a, on a normal neck you don't do. You, you do this, this weird twist, twist in your wrist. Very ergonomic when you play them. Very light, very nicely made. Um, but they're, they're becoming really popular. You see them a lot. If you're into progressive uh, metal music, you'll see these guitars all the time. And then there's this, Tuffle. German builder. This guitar is called the Birdfish. Um, neck made out of aluminum, um, like those two bars of wood at the top, you can replace them by different woods. Um, if you believe that changes the, st the sound, then it probably changes the sound for you. It probably doesn't. Um, but like, and the, the, this, this, this thing here is where all the knobs are sitting and all the electronics. I mean, this this is something they made for a trade show. I think it's, it's fantastic and shows how innovative you can be when you're building guitars. And it's one of the reasons that I got into it. It's like, I don't want to build the same guitar twice. I also never wanted to build the same software system twice. So this is the stuff that pulled me in. This is the stuff that I really love. There's a lot of innovation happening in that space. Um, and the one thing that I want to close out with, how much time do we have? 13 minutes, right? Yes, OK, got time for this. Um, as software developers, what is the thing that we're always basically getting for free? Undo. Our undos are virtually free. You can press Control z for small things. You can go back on your branch for the bigger things. Um, but with wood, like with Git, like you've seen diagrams like this, right? Git flow. Um, with wood, when we remove a piece of wood, there is no control Z. Once you remove it, it's gone. If you're using a router, it, it gets transformed into dust. There's not even a piece of wood you can glue back on. It's, it's just like evaporated, right? And on every piece of woodwork, uh, every piece that you make as a woodworker, you're probably going to make mistakes. And what makes an expert woodworking, uh, woodworker is that they can produce an end result where you don't notice the mistakes, right? But on this guitar, because I'm not really that good, there's a couple of mistakes that I made. And I believe in failing in the open, so I'm going to show you all of the mistakes that you probably wouldn't have noticed if you picked up the guitar. So when you pick it up later, you're free to do so. Um, like, look for them. This is where my router slipped when I was routing out the neck pocket and I took out a piece of wood, and it took me, it was a two-second mistake, and it took me an evening to fix. I had to match a piece of wood, get the grain in the same direction, um, perfectly curve it to the hole that I had made, glue it back in, and then route my neck pocket again. Took an evening to fix. And you can still notice it when you pick up the guitar, you see the line. <clears throat> also there at the bottom, I forgot to clean up the glue before I oiled the guitar, so the oil didn't really seep into the wood there, so you can still see that 
I was a bit sloppy there. Now, <clears throat> the thickness, I was on a mission to build the lightest and compactest, uh, most compact guitar that I could make because I wanted to travel with this thing to conferences. Why? I'll come back to that in a moment. But So I figured I can make this body really thin. There is no structural reason for me to have a very thick body. And I wanted to use this switch. It's called a super switch. It allows you to have four poles that you can switch between five different positions, which allows you to make um, five very, very distinct wiring combinations between your pickups. It's called a super switch for a reason. Um, now, this is the switch that I bought that I wanted to use for that guitar. And you can see that the height of the electronics is 34 millimeters. Now, that body is 32 millimeters thick, right? I didn't really think that through. So I was trying to put in the switch and like, ah, it doesn't fit. So now it has two very small switches that allow me to get more positions than five, but I still wanted to have a single switch and I didn't. Um, I still have that switch lying around. It's a 30 euro switch. I'm not throwing it out until I can use it on another guitar. But I have to put more thought into that, make sure that it fits. Also this, this is my brand, Weasel Guitars. Uh, I live in a village called Weasel in Dutch, um, which translates to Weasel in English, and I thought it was a pretty cool uh, thing. So I was doing the wood um, burning thing where I was putting this down. So I was like, okay, this is gonna be on the body, so if it's misaligned with the neck, it's gonna look really ugly. So I made a metal jig that helped me put, without like heating the, the, the burning mark, I put, down, it put it down a couple of times to make sure that I could consistently get it straight against that jig. And then I heated it up and did all the test pieces. And it's like, okay, I'm ready. I have to push it down for 12 seconds. So I, thought, I, mean, I heat it up, 12 seconds. I pull it back up, was upside down, right? <laughs> yes, obviously. So what I had to do on that guitar is, is send the body a little bit away. If you, if you look at it from the side, you'll see that that part of the body is sanded a little bit in a curve to get that burn mark out and to do it again, like right way up. Also very easy mistake, also cost me an evening to fix. So that is what that looks like from the sides. You see that, that part of the guitar, it's, it's curving away just a tiny bit, right? So that brings me to the end. What is my plan with all of this? Um, nothing really, it's my hobby, um, and I love spending time on this. Um, in software, I'm just gonna keep building things and I'm going to keep learning from all the mistakes. I'm going to keep sharing my experience because knowledge sharing is what I do and love and live for, um, which is why in guitar building, I'm also going to keep building. This is the guitar that I'm building right now. I'm building it for another software developer. Um, there are circuit boards in there and LED lighting and, and um, crazy, crazy pretty um, spalted beach. Um, if you want to follow those builds, you can now find me on Twitch as well. I have like five followers, I don't care, because I do believe in failing out in the open. Uh, if you want to follow me on week evenings uh, when I'm building stuff, you can talk to me through Discord and I can answer on stream. I do have uh, Bluetooth earplugs um, that I can use in my workshop, but I'm not looking at a screen because a lot of this for me is about not staring at a screen. But I do love interaction and I do love failing in, in the open. So. You will see me fuck up pieces of wood on this stream and how I recover from that and all of the, the builds that I do. Um, that's it for what I wanted to tell you today. This is my streaming setup. So because I'm in a workshop at Dusty Environment, I use an Atem Mini Pro, and Atem Mini Pro is a hardware device that doesn't require a computer to be connected to it when you stream to Twitch. You just put in all of your HDMI inputs, which means that I have my um, wireless mic receiver next to it, there is a GoPro on my work desk that, on my desk that I can uh, tilt and swivel and move to the place where I want it to be. Um, obviously, there is another GoPro that takes an overview shot of the workshop that is right there. And then I have a camera on a tripod, um, which you will see in a second, that will give me the close-up shots of whatever I'm doing that has a huge ring light around it. Okay, I go nerdy into all things, right? Um, as you can feel. Um, but that allows me to stream from my workshop. If you are interested in seeing that, like, hit me up on, on, on uh, this conference. Um, the reason I built this guitar is because um, Dylan Beatty, who is also here as a speaker, formed a band together with Eli, by the way, who did the keynote. Um, 
we have a band where we ruin your favorite songs. Some of that may make it into tomorrow's uh, guitarioki. So if you want to see that, um, please come and take a look, which is also why I travel to conferences with this thing. Uh, not tomorrow at 10, it'll be a little bit ear yeah, earlier. Um, I'm Hannes, I'm the head of learning and development at a company called Access in Belgium. Uh, that's my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I'm trying to make ICQ great again. Um, I've been making that joke for five years and only five people have talked to me on ICQ. But I do have an app and it does work. So if you use that ICQ number, you are actually talking to my phone right there. Thank you so much for joining and for indulging me on this uh, guitar building rant. I hope you have a beautiful afternoon. I didn't see anyone taking any naps, so great, you made it through lunch. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, rest of your conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Grab the guitar or whatever, uh, feel free to do so, um, it doesn't bite.